Well, good evening, good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Steve Sang. I am the director of the SOAS China Institute. Let me welcome you to another of our webinars on China. Before I introduce the speaker and the subject, let me just remind you that if you would like to ask a question at the end of the presentation, please use the Q&A function at the right hand bottom of your screen. When you do so, it would be very helpful if you would provide information about yourself for my uh, benefit. If you would like to stay anonymous while you raise a question or a comment, and if you indicate that you would like anonymity, it will be respected. But the information will still enable me to pick questions more effectively than if I don't have that information. For the uh, presentation, I'm delighted to have Professor David Bachman to speak to us on the subject of aspects of defense industrialization in China from 1949 to 1989, a very important period of China's uh, development. Our speaker holds the Henry Jackson Professorship of International Studies at the Jackson School of International Studies, University of Washington in Seattle. He was educated at Stanford University where he received his PhD. He then taught at Stanford and at Princeton before he moved to his current position at the University of Washington. He is the author of many learned uh, papers. I will only mention the two books that I think uh, should be mentioned in particular. One is Chinese Political System, Bureaucracy, Economy and Leadership in China, The Institutional Origins of the Great Leap Forward, which is a book that he uh, published entirely himself. He's also the co-editor with uh, Professor Dali Yang of Yan Jiaqi and China's struggle for democracy. He is currently working on a book on China's defense industrialization, which is very much the subject of what he is going to be talking to us in the next 40 to 45 minutes. Over to you, David. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for uh, the China Institute for inviting me. Uh, obviously, for multiple reasons, I'd love to be doing this in person, uh, but I, this is the next best thing. So let me uh, move on. So this is a book project that's been in the works for way too long. Uh, it's part history of defense industrialization in China. Uh, it uh, examines the effect of defense industrialization on China's political economy. And it also looks at how defense industrialization fit in with uh, China's foreign and defense policy in terms of strategy and so on, sort of a supplement to the kind of work that uh, Taylor Fravel did with his book on active defense. Uh, he's providing the sort of doctrine and strategy side. This is a look at weapons procurement and, and, uh, and building of factories to produce the weapons. The book is based on a wide range of documentary and statistical and industrial census sources. From these sources, I've built a database uh, that argues or that, that I think I can show that there were 1,161 large and medium scale defense enterprises in China in 1985, out of a total of 8,285 uh, large and medium industrial enterprises. Uh, 
And I got this basically from the 1985 PRC industrialization, uh, industrial census. The presentation today is based on uh, the history uh, and political economy of defense industrialization of the, the first and second parts of the book. So why write on defense industrialization? So Mao, of course, is well known for the saying, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun and the party must command the gun. In the English language literature on, uh, on this saying, uh, this statement has been uh, interpreted in two ways. One, it reflected a statement of necessity that the, P the CCP was almost wiped out in uh, 1927 because it lacked an army. Uh, and therefore, the conclusion was, of course, that the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, had to have its own army. Others have taken this uh, statement uh, and the follow on uh, about political power growing out of the barrel of a gun uh, and the party commanding the gun uh, as a sort of metaphor for tensions between party and army in the PLA, in the CCP and PRC period. But I'm focusing on the third and much more direct kind of, of issue here. And that is, if political power grows out of the barrel of the gun and the CCP must have an army, where and how does the party and its army get its guns? Uh, building on that, how does obtaining guns impact the overall economy? How do the weapons procured fit into strategy? Uh, what does the amount of investment and the rate of production tell us about perceptions of threat and these kinds of issues? And certainly Mao was not the only Chinese leader to believe this. Uh, Chinese modernizers since the 1860s had made developing an arms industry a core goal of the Chinese state. I'm not going to talk about that today, but uh, that many factories uh, can trade that uh, were important during the P early 40 years of the PRC uh, trace their origins back to the self-strengtheners uh, and the modernizers of the 1860s and beyond. So the short answer to where the guns came from was that after 1949, they overwhelmingly came from the Soviet Union. Uh, and even after the break in 1960, uh, Soviet weapon systems would be the basis for Chinese military power into the early 1990s. Um, and this is a major theme of the first part of the book. You know, almost no sector of the Chinese political and economic system after 1949 had as deep a Soviet imprint on it as did the defense industrial sector. Uh, some of this is deliberate and some of it is by default, as I'll get to. This may not be an earth-shaking kind of argument, but there are elements to the Soviet defense industrial system transferred to China that are not so widely appreciated. I'm, I don't have slides on this, but it, I'm going to give you a kind of path dependence argument that suggests that the Soviet style of industrialization is quite different than American, English, German, uh, Japanese during World War II and so on. So let me speak for a few minutes about the Soviet defense industrial model and China. So based on World War II, the Soviet economy and defense industry was less advanced than the US, UK, and Germany in World War II, especially if we use uh, GDP per capita as a proxy for technological ability. Yet the Soviets were able to defeat Germany through a profligate use of men and resources and the intense mobilization of Soviet society. There were big gaps between the Soviet Union and China, but certainly less of a gap in terms of technical levels uh, between the Soviet Union and China than China and the United States and UK. Um, with Soviet and Stalinist ideology, there was a firm belief in the Soviet Union that Mao shared that the socialist that socialist states were embedded in a capitalist world economy. War with capitalism was inevitable. The Soviet Union must be ready for war. War and defense preparation was a core element of the Soviet economy after 1927, if not before. <clears throat> 
World War I and World War II were both decisive in different ways for the Soviet Union. Uh, there was ma these were massive, industrialized, prolonged conflicts that posed existential threats to the regime in power. Uh, and an assumption, and this was an assumption and reality built into the Soviet system, and I would argue transferred to China. The Soviets fought World War II and World and the Russia fought World War I based on massive land-based combat, prioritizing infantry, artillery, armor, and increasingly tactical air. War was fought through attrition and maneuver. The system had to generate lots of weaponry before conflict began, anticipating a war of attrition. And after war, after conflict broke out, the system had to generate hugely greater quantities of weapons and other requisite materials. Soviet experience emphasized, emphasized land-based combat, uh, combat artillery and armor was unique among major combatants in World War II. They, they spent much more of their defense budget on these things than did other major combatants during World War II. Uh, the others emphasized air, air defense, and Navy for where most of their money went to uh, in fighting World War II. Uh, for Germany, Japan, UK, US. Uh, and so uh, the Soviet experience of land-based war uh, with most of the resources going to infantry and, and their equipment largely matched China's war with Japan and uh, the Civil War. Soviet military uh, personnel were generally poorly educated. Soviet military equipment was generally rugged, reliable, and relatively easy to maintain, and in some cases, close to state of the art. Uh, weapon systems characteristics, in other words, roughly corresponded to the skill levels of military personnel uh, who would use them. For the Soviet Union, there were relatively uh, few uh, basic, uh, few modifications in basic weapon systems designed. Once weapon systems entered production, they were produced in huge numbers at scale. And because of scale and, and not changing them all the time, you had uh, a quite, quite cost-effective or cheap weapons. Moreover, the Soviets produced many fewer weapons types than most other combatants. Uh, when it came to land warfare, the Soviets produced about 34 basic types of weapons the Germans were producing more than 130, uh, which is why the Germans couldn't produce nearly as much as the Soviets did. The Soviets imposed a strict quality control system and ability to surge production in as part of the basic nature of the system. The Soviets built large factories to produce military equipment, yet it was recognized that normal production would not be enough for wartime needs. Therefore, Soviet defense factories had excess capacity, which in times of relative peace could be used for civilian production. Moreover, in the event of full-scale war, non-defense factories would be tasked with defense production as well. The Soviet system also separated uh, defense industrial production from defense industrial research and design, a system that carried over directly to China and sort of to sum this up, the Soviet victory in World War II reinforced many of these elements of the Soviet model. Stalin stopped being able to purge military heroes of World War II. I could put them aside, but he couldn't purge them. Uh, leaders who successfully mobilized to fight the Germans uh, became, uh, <clears throat> became the leaders of the Soviet Union for the next 30 or so years. Um, World War II was the most formative experience for these leaders when it came to political, military, and economic affairs. Uh, for the Soviet Union, and I would argue also for China, the lessons of World War II would be reified and perhaps frozen in place. By extension, this was the system that was transplanted uh, to China from the Soviet Union. And remember when the PRC was established in 1949, uh, World War II was just four years uh, before. Uh, the Soviets had tested nuclear weapons weeks before October 1st, 1949, 
no one else could supply or would be willing to supply China with weapons. And so China was, was stuck, if you will, with the Soviet system. Uh, but again, uh, they weren't unhappy with that in 1949. And they would, uh, in many respects, buy into that system without necessarily reflecting on or knowing some of these background factors that affected uh, the, how the Soviet system worked uh, and that the biases that were inbuilt into it. So if I were to briefly sort of characterize the history of defense industrialization in China, from 49 to 64, you had the Soviet phase of defense industrialization. China was building Soviet factories in China. Uh, it was using Soviet designs and specifications in all weapon systems. There were Soviet experts in, uh, in China, major Chinese factories. Chinese managers and students went to the Soviet Union. These were all fairly well-known factors. Soviet quality control uh, uh, techniques were imported. Uh, even after the Soviets left, Soviet hardware and software largely remained in place. Uh, and indeed, you know, even after the Soviets left, the Soviets sold China the plans to MiG-21s in 1961-62. Um, so in this way, the Soviet defense industrial path was embedded in China, uh, I would argue. From 65 to 71, uh, in contrast to the, the Soviet phase in defense industrialization, you had the defense sector's great leap forward. This was, of course, the third front period. Uh, it was characterized by excessive haste, waste, poor planning, massive expansion of the defense industrial sector, affected particularly in 67 and 68 by cultural revolution violence. We could ask whether, in fact, this this period of heavy, very heavy defense industrialization actually made China more secure. I'll come back to that in the conclusion to the talk. And from 72 to 89, basically was, uh, was roughly equivalent to the period after the great leap forward for the rest of the economy, a period of drift and readjustment. Some factories were closed, others shifted entirely to civilian production all factories increased civilian production. There was very limited military procurement in the 1980s. Arguably, the ordnance industry survived only because of exports and civilian production. And with that, I'm going to show you uh, a number of, of tables about defense industry uh, development and so on. Uh, they don't come across as well as they might on PowerPoint, but uh, I'll talk through them as best I can. Um, so let me look at, show you some of the data from my project uh, and show you some of what I've found. Again, apologize if it's hard to see. Um, this is a work in progress and I fear I'm caught up with the de details. Big picture may be la lacking and hopefully in the questions and answers, uh, you'll help me figure out some of the big details. So let's start with uh, what the defense industry looked like at the start. So uh, in 1985, uh, from my database of 1,161 factories, I've got details about which sector of the defense industry they were um, uh, attached to for 1,152. So we, for ordnance or land-based combat, 372, electronics, 281. As you can see, uh, the last column uh, is nuclear with 49. So, um, <clears throat> so obviously uh, ordnance was the number one subfield of the defense industry followed by electronics and the PLA. Uh, PLA, as I've already mentioned, experience was largely ground-based and for bureaucratic, organizational, and experiential reasons, not surprising that the, the Chinese high command would favor land-based weapons. Mao, following uh, Fravel's uh, interpretation and in active defense, also strongly board, uh, boosted ordnance industries uh, in the 1960s so that they could be the basis for resisting revisionism as part of the emerging cultural revolution. Uh, 
or the basis of local guerrilla warfare against a US or Soviet invasion. Electronics is somewhat more surprising, uh, perhaps. Um, there was a particularly obscure period during 69, 70, 71, when someone, perhaps Chun Bo Da, uh, was strongly advocating building electronics factories for radar, communications, and other military uses. PLA enterprises were a diverse set of factories. For example, there was a PLA printing press in every major, major regional PLA headquarters. PLA tailoring facilities were 60% of all large and medium tailoring enterprises uh, in 1985. But other PLA enterprises were naval shipyards and uh, repair yards, aircraft maintenance facilities, armories for repair and uh, maintenance of tanks, and so on. Prior to 49, there had been very limited uh, Chinese production of modern warships and aircraft. So most of these factories and shipyards are of post-1949 vintage. And that is absolutely true of missiles and nuclear weapons. So the second table uh, gives you a sense of, of data uh, about what I have in terms of number of people employed, its output in 1985, the fixed assets embedded in production uh, in the facilities of the factories. So uh, about two and a half million uh, people working in the defense sector, which was uh, a little less than 4% of all industrial employment. It was more than 11% of large and medium enterprises. Um, output almost 3 billion yuan, uh, which was about a little less than 4% uh, of uh, national industrial totals uh, and close to 8% of large and medium enterprises. And fixed assets, 5.3% 5, 5 of uh, all national industry um, and 8% plus of large and medium enterprises. Probably if I had all the data, we'd be closer to 12% of all labor uh, in large and medium, eight or 9% of output and 10% or so of fixed assets. Okay. The, um, this third table gives a sense of the provincial distribution of uh, defense enterprises by provincial level units. This is 1985, so there were 29 provincial, provincial level units. Uh, Hainan becomes a province next, uh, in 86, and Chongqing becomes a centrally administered city in the late 90s. So, but, so we're talking about uh, Chongqing being part of Sichuan for the entire purpose of the talk. So not unsurprisingly, we know that um, <clears throat> there were uh, the most defense industrial enterprises in the Northwest and the Southwest, what we know about the Third Front. Uh, I'll talk more about Guizhou, uh, Sichuan, Shanxi, and Gansu uh, at, uh, later on. But here we see that uh, you know, Sichuan was, uh, was the overwhelmingly largest uh, center of defense industry, uh, followed by Guizhou and Shanxi, uh, and then moving on down. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll have more to say about these details later on. Um, there are quite different profiles across different provinces, and the percentage these made up of all uh, large and medium enterprises also shifts quite dramatically. Uh, in general, as we'll get to, provinces that, uh, that had uh, more than 20% of uh, their large and medium enterprises in defense enterprises uh, were in the bottom half of per capita GDP for an extended period of time. Uh, provinces uh, that had less than 10% of their economies uh, in large and medium defense enterprises tended to do extremely well uh, in the, 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 um, the reform period and have to this day, very high uh, per capita income. So on average, there were 40 uh, defense enterprises per province. They averaged about 14% of all large and medium uh, enterprises uh, on an average basis. Okay, so 
moving on from this. Again, I'm sorry for the, this is hard to read. If we look at the temporal development of the defense enterprises uh, by different sectors, we had prior to 1949, 70 enterprises, uh, most ordnance, some electronics, some the PLA, uh, and, and so on. And I, I, I want to clarify with the 1985 database, uh, you know, this is when enterprises got started, even if they weren't producing uh, defense, uh, uh, defense products. So for example, uh, Capital Machinery in Beijing, which produces missiles, uh, was established in 1939. Uh, it, and, and that's what it says in the uh, census materials, the industrial census materials. It certainly wasn't producing uh, missiles in 1939. Uh, it was obviously Beijing was under Japanese occupation in 1939, so it wasn't even producing weapon systems for the Chinese military at that time. But in the 1960s, it became a missile producer, and that's what we know it as. So some of these things were not actually producing weapons at the time. But just go through this, we can see that uh, from uh, different time periods, the production of weapons, uh, of weapons factories. So 70 existed in 49, you added 78, 49 to 52. You added 61 during the first five year plan, 104 during the Great Leap Forward, 65 in uh, 61 to 64, 543 during the third front of 65, 71 and 206 from 1972 to 1985 when census materials ends. And I don't know uh, about 34. So this averaged the production of 28 and a half or 29 factory defense factories a year from 49 to 85. And it breaks it down by various sectors here. Um, so, um, yeah, let me just move on since I'm using time. So this compares the development of uh, defense industries versus non-defense industries. And what we can see here is that uh, prior to uh, 1960, there was a steady development of defense industrialization in the PRC, but defense industries were never 10% of, of all the uh, factories uh, built during uh, the period. That began to change in 1961 uh, and particularly 62 when the rate of, uh, of defense industries coming online uh, began to grow quite rapidly uh, where it became 20%, uh, 20, more than 20% of uh, non-defense enterprises and 17.5% of all large and medium enterprises. The third front period, obviously uh, a huge increase uh, both in the relative share and absolute share of defense, large and medium enterprises. And that continued from 72 to 1985. Uh, and so um, up from 61 on, they're above average uh, in terms of when defense enterprises uh, or how they compare to both overall industrialization, uh, large and medium industries, uh, and compared to civilian industries. Some more detail about this in the next chart. Again, this is hard to follow, but uh, if we look at the, uh, <clears throat> the three main sectors and the 1985 industrial census used um, 39 categories of defense industry, uh, sorry, of industry. Uh, the three major categories were, def were machinery, uh, for defense industries were machinery, category 34, sector 34, transportation, uh, sector 35, uh, and uh, 37 electronics. So 34 would include ordnance and space enterprises. Uh, transportation would include air, naval, and many PLA factories. 
37, electronics, military communications, and so on. As we can see here, uh, defense, <clears throat> uh, defense electronics outnumbered non-defense electronics in every, in every period uh, in the PRC. Defense uh, machinery enterprises only greatly uh, increased significantly compared to non-defense machinery factories after nine, uh, 1960. Should be noted that machinery as a category was the largest single uh, one of large and medium enterprises in the 1985 industrial census with 1,855 enterprises. Defense transportation was always a higher relative priority uh, than defense machinery. Uh, defense transportation was never less than 30% of non-defense transportation and for about 25 years was 100% of non-defense transportation. The table suggests that the three largest sectors of heavy industry, uh, non-defense construction greatly diminished after 1971. Uh, more research would have to be done here, but on this basis, I'd be uh, willing to argue that, uh, that the period of heavy, extensive uh, industrial expansion had started to ebb by 1972 in PRC economic history. And while many factors can contribute to an understanding of why the slowdown of non-defense construction was taking place in these three sectors, it does argue that the Soviet style of industrialization in China was beginning to come to an end after 1971. Okay. So, um, this, um, the, this table shows you the ranking of, uh, based on official figures that were published uh, in the late 2000s, uh, of uh, the ranking of defense industry investment and defense science and technology investment compared to other sectors in the Chinese economy. You, from 52 to 65. Um, and based on this, we can see that the uh, defense sector was always a very high priority, except for one year in the Great Leap Forward. Uh, but it averaged between th ranking three and four uh, out of 12 sectors, surpassed only by metallurgy, uh, electric power and rivaled by coal, all of which were very capital intensive sectors requiring lots of investment. So um, this gives us a sense of uh, the budgetary priorities for investing in heavy industry, uh, for, for heavy industry and the defense sector. And let me move on. I tried to construct estimates of defense, uh, defense industrial production, uh, how, how worthy these are of any sort of use remains to be seen. Um, I'm getting a little short of time. I'm not going to explain this uh, in any great detail, but I'm, I'm arguing that we could estimate that defense industrial production was about uh, 10% or so, 9%, 10%, uh, maybe a little higher in, um, uh, in the Great Leap, uh, in the um, Third Front period. Um, and uh, this is of all state-owned enterprise production at that time. I have a lower estimate based on another methodology. I'm happy to explain this during questions and answers, but I think I should just uh, not go into this in particular detail at this, uh, this time. As mentioned with part of the Soviet system uh, that a lot of uh, factory output from defense enterprises went into civilian production. And from this, uh, from the data I found based on materials from five provinces, Anhui, Gansu, Guangxi, uh, Liaoning and Shanxi, um, we can see uh, that civilian production ebbed and flowed out of their defense enterprises. Um, as noted there, this generally excludes PLA and electronics firms. Uh, but during the early 60s, we can see civilian production 
uh, goes down from 42% of total output from uh, these factories to 17% to 12%. Uh, and with the third front period down to 8% and stays below 20% until 1975, uh, stays below 25% until 1979. And then by 1989, it's 73% of all output from uh, the factories uh, in these provinces for which there are data. Okay. And then uh, <clears throat> we have data on exports by uh, the defense sector for the 1980s. Uh, so pay attention here to the left column that uh, exports from uh, the total ordinance industry uh, as a percentage of all production. These are based on two different series of data. So they're somewhat different, but nonetheless, in 1985, 25% of all output from the ordinance industry was exported. In 86, 45%, 87, 55, 88, 31, uh, and 89, 17% uh, or so. Uh, most of this was going to Iran and Iraq, uh, but this gives you a sense of you know, what the defense industrial sector, at least the ordnance industry was doing uh, to survive as it was being deprived of budgetary resources, defense spending being held flat uh, during much of the 1980s. Uh, again, let me move on. Uh, and this, this unmanageable table is, uh, the uh, data of, of Liaoning province distribution across different defense industrial sectors, aviation, ordnance, naval, missiles, and nuclear. Liaoning uh, is a major center for China's aviation. Uh, it was uh, Shenyang Aircraft Corporation, uh, is the premier jet fighter production facility, or it was from 49 to 85. Uh, the, it's also a major ordnance producer. It had significant naval shipyards um, in, uh, in Dalian and, uh, uh, and, uh, oh, uh, who, uh, <clears throat> and the nuclear submarine facility uh, also on the Bohai Gulf. Uh, and so from this, we could look at relative priority and perception of threat. Uh, and we could see that the uh, that aviation uh, in, for most of the period was the priority, uh, planes being more expensive than tanks, other things equal, uh, but it was aviation, conventional ordnance, uh, and then uh, naval uh, and missile production. Uh, these were not significant or terribly significant missile production facilities in Liaoning. So uh, let me move on. So let me let's include the sort of data presentation with looking at four provinces, Guizhou, Sichuan, Shanxi, and Gansu. So with, <clears throat> with Guizhou, Guizhou was the province that was most affected by defense industrialization. Uh, you can see that there was one defense factory which actually wasn't producing defense goods uh, in uh, created prior to 1964. Uh, Guizhou, obviously a poor province, not much industrialization. But if we look then at 65 to 71, you build uh, in Guizhou 40 large um, uh, defense factories, 27 medium size. And by 1985, you end up with 83 defense factories only one of which existed prior to 1965 out of a total of 175 factories. So 46% of large and medium enterprises in Guizhou were uh, defense factories, all of them built uh, after 1964. So Guizhou was, um, um, you know, it, uh, <clears throat> it generally, 
was in the bottom five for capital construction investment uh, in uh, 53 to 64. Its average capital construction rank was 23rd, 64 to 71, it was top 10. Again, after 73, bottom 10. Uh, but for the entire period from 53 to 95, its GDP per capita ranked in the bottom five. So there was dramatic structural economic change caused by defense industrialization, but there was little change in the position in the uh, national economy. Uh, so that you had much more industrial employment, uh, but you really didn't have uh, a fundamental change in how the economy uh, worked for the people of uh, Guizhou uh, in some ways. And indeed, basically <clears throat> from 1965 to 75, there was no change in per capita income um, at, at an absolute level uh, going out. So here we have a case where uh, the third front period was absolutely decisive to the industrial structure of, uh, of Guizhou. Turning to Sichuan. <clears throat> so with Sichuan, the situation is somewhat more complex. Let me take a drink. <clears throat> It had the most defense enterprises in the country by more than 50 over Guizhou and Shanxi. Um, Sichuan, of course, had been the KMT's redoubt during the war against Japan. The sagas of factories being moved, removed from Wuhan and other cities and transported up the Yangtze during the early days of the Sino-Japanese War of 37 to 45 is well known. Uh, these would include some enterprises that would be core and ordnance plants well into the history of the PRC. Uh, <clears throat> as well, of the 287 uh, turnkey factories the Soviet Union was to sell to China, 88 were defense factories uh, for, for defense purposes. Uh, one of these might have, been, have included four projects related to nu nuclear weapons. In any event, 10 of the 88 Soviet factories uh, were in Sichuan. Uh, Sichuan had a fairly large and important industrial base uh, in the 1950s and a significant place in the national defense uh, economy as well in the 50s and into the 60s. Uh, nonetheless, almost 100 new defense plants would be built in Sichuan, 65 to 85 with more large defense factories built over this period than large non-defense factories. Yet, as with Guizhou, uh, there was not much of a change in per capita GDP from 53 to 85, or 95, sorry. Shanxi was a, uh, the province that received the most Soviet plants, uh, 50, 53 to uh, 90, uh, to 60. Uh, 21. Uh, it was already a high priority defense industrial base by 1960 and would see substantial increase in its defense established establishment from 65 to 85. Uh, but the increase during the third front period and after was not as large as in Guizhou or Sichuan in relative terms. Uh, and defense industrial construction outpaced, uh, sorry, non defense industrial construction outpaced defense production, um, construction 65 to 85, uh, substantially so during the core third front period. But again, there was no major change in per capita GDP on a rank order basis. Finally, Gansu. Uh, so <clears throat> Gansu received four Soviet defense plants uh, and the two large nuclear plants in Gansu may also have been uh, on the Soviet contracts list or another special list of Soviet projects. Gansu had a limited industrial base prior to 1985. It had the seventh fewest uh, large and medium enterprises among provincial level units in 1985. Uh, the, thir the third front and after did see an upsurge in defense industrial construction in Gansu but it was much smaller than the non-defense increase in Gansu, especially 65 to 71 and less so 72 to 85. 
again, this had little perceptible impact on GDP per capita. So with that, let me thankfully relieve you of data charts and, uh, and talk about, so what? Uh, what are the key takeaways from this presentation uh, and defense industrialization in China, 49 to 89? So first and most basically, defense industrialization was a substantial and fundamental aspect of Chinese economic history from 49 to the mid 1980s. Uh, defense enterprises constituted 14% of all large and medium enterprises in China. If the defense industrial se uh, sector was a separate category in the 40 category system used to characterize Chinese uh, industrial enterprises in the 1985 industrial census, it would be the second largest sector uh, after machinery, subtracting defense machinery plants. If we include factories that provided substantial inputs to defense production, or that during the Great Leap Four, uh, sorry, the uh, Third Front period produced weapons uh, that were organized to defense mobilization production lines, another thousand or so large and medium enterprises were deeply connected to defense industrialization at one time, constituting well over a quarter of all large and medium enterprises. Second, the pattern of defense industrialization is generally in keeping with the degree of threat in China's external security environment. There was a steady buildup in defense enterprises in the 1950s as part of China's overall industrialization drive. But the Sino-Soviet alliance meant that China was, was not on its own um, uh, and it did not need to concentrate on China's def on defense industrialization. While there was a significant increase in defense enterprises coming into production during the Great Leap Forward, the non-defense industrial sector grew substantially more. But with the effective ending of the alliance uh, and, increasingly worrisome, and an increasingly worrisome external and internal developments, defense industrialization became a much higher priority. Uh, third, although this has been asserted more than presented today, the defense system was profoundly influenced by the Soviet pattern of defense industrialization as well as Soviet designs, weapon systems, defense uh, factory management systems, specifications for machinery, et cetera. When politics was in command, Soviet type managerial systems were ignored or attacked. And when, when it was time for rectification of the excesses of politics and command, at least for the defense sector, China had no other real model to turn to except Soviet managerial practices. Fourth, Defense industrialization was a lasting legacy to the political economy of every province. In 1985, there was tremendous variation in the proportion of output from large and medium enterprises to total provincial gross value of industrial out, uh, output. With little more than 22% of Zhejiang's gross value of industrial output coming from large and medium enterprises, while 72% of Gansu's came from large and medium enterprises. This speaks to Kelly Tsai's argument on capitalism without democracy, that there are a number of different patterns of provincial political economies, and that in the places where state-owned enterprises dominate, dominated, uh, as in the Southwest, Northwest, and Northeast, reform policies emphasizing marketization, light industry, and smaller enterprises were generally stymied. These are the places in general with the lowest per capita incomes in China. This is not all due to defense industries, but it is not unrelated either, particularly for Sichuan, Guizhou, Shanxi, and Gansu. Uh, conversely, those provinces with the lowest proportion, proportion of GVIO coming from large and medium enterprises uh, have uh, the greatest income gains leaving aside Tibet. As well, uh, the third front with its emphasis on dispersed production, building factories or workshops in caves and other remote locations uh, uh, and building tremendous redundancy added considerable inefficiencies to the already inefficient planned economy. 
China would spend additional billions in the 80s and 90s trying to remove factories, uh, to move factories in remote locations to major urban centers, closing down other factories and otherwise absorbing lots of other costs of adjustment to try and salvage something from these factories. Finally, we might ask, did China's history of defense industrialization make China more secure? China, of course, was not invaded, uh, but its military fell increasingly behind the technological state of the art as the combination of the break with the Soviets and Maoist attacks on professionals and higher education stymied the, uh, uh, the creation of an effective managerial system and the production of large numbers of high quality scientists and engineers. The nuclear and missile programs got first call on remaining top scientific and technical talent. There was little left over for other defense industries, much less non-defense industries. There was very little innovation in the, the other elements of the defense sector. Uh, and what innovation there was, was fairly marginal changes on the basis of pre-existing Soviet designs. Arguably, the nuclear and missile programs and the Sino-American rapprochement of the early 1970s did more for Chinese security than did the construction of the rest of the defense industrialization system uh, during the Third Front period. Moreover, whether the US or the Soviet Union ever seriously considered invading China, uh, which is what China's military strategy was geared towards, is an open question. Certainly in the 1950s and into the 60s, US war plans for China were generally nuclear, not conventional. Uh, in that regard, China's defense industrialization was essentially moot. Uh, the Soviet Union was thought to have seriously considered an attack on China in 69 to 70, but chose not to. But it is far from clear that their contingency planning, what their contingency planning might have been, and it is doubtful that the Soviets would have struck, stuck around to occupy China and thus be subject to guerrilla war. So with the benefit of hindsight, it is, it is far from clear that much of China's defense industrialization did much to enhance Chinese security. Only in 1999 did defense budgets begin to increase again, newly trained scientists and engineers educated at close to the state of the art and Soviet Russian equipment began to really modernize China's defense industries. And with that, I've gone on more than too long. Let me stop and take your questions. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, David. I think it's extremely interesting presentation that you have with enormous amount of data. Um, there are specific issues that one could raise with you. And before I go to the questions that we already have, um, let me start off by asking you something much more general. You decided, <coughs> sorry, you decided to end the project in the year 1989. And I'm trying to push you here as to why 1989 was significant in for the um, military industrialization of China. Was it a political uh, dividing line that you see as significant? Or was there something with that military industrialization or industrial development of the Chinese military that marked 1989 out as a particularly important year for the project to conclude? I mean, you seem to be suggesting that in fact, it really gets a bit more into the 1990s before the big changes would happen. Um, so there are a couple of reasons why I stop in 89. Uh, one is, where well, a couple are convenient. Uh, one is that most of the data that I have sort of disappears in 85 or 1989, uh, so that, that I have much less material to go on. Uh, another is that I do see 1989 as a real fundamental inflection point uh, where uh, after uh, Tiananmen, uh, you have a, a, a rethinking of strategy uh, where defense spending begins to go up again, where uh, 
uh, you begin uh, to purchase uh, Soviet and then Russian weapon systems to modernize, um, uh, particularly after 91 and the, the Gulf War, a recognition of by the, on the part of the Chinese about how truly backward their military industrial production is and their equipment is. Um, all of these push China in very different directions. Um, and so, and I also thought 40 years was a nice convenient ending point. Uh, so that's why I stopped in 89. And, you know, it, at least in the US, um, there are huge arguments uh, among people who have the kind of specialized knowledge about the capability of weapon systems, about how big a threat uh, the Chinese military is to American interests. I don't have that kind of specialized knowledge. I didn't really want to engage in those kinds of fights about, yes, it's a very modern military threatening the US or no, it's still backward uh, and not a major threat. Um, I mean, that kind of argument, I didn't have a comparative advantage uh, in speaking to and didn't actually find them all that interesting in terms of, of, of how uh, we, we, you know, we, we judge a J-20 fighter versus a US F-35, um, you know, I'm in no position to speak to that. Uh, and I don't, you know, it all depends on who shoots first and a whole bunch of other contingencies that can't be predicted. So essentially that's why I stopped in 89. Okay, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, let me just remind everybody that if you would like to raise a question or pose a comment, please use the Q&A box. You can do that anonymously, but it would be helpful if you could say who you are for my benefit. I will not read out your name if you would like anonymity. The first question I am um, reading out to you comes from Fabio Molind in uh, Rome, Italy. Were there moments of confrontation between the political leadership and the Chinese high command during the period of assessment? And far as industrialization and military policy guidelines, as far as industrialization and military policy guidelines were concerned. Um, you know, this is one of the <clears throat> uh, sort of major questions I'm thinking about. Um, at least in the 40s and 50s, the, uh, the defense industrial plan actually was drawn up by the Military Affairs Commission, uh, that uh, we have uh, lots of evidence that um, people like Peng Dehuai, uh, Xu Xiangqian, uh, Nie Rongzhan, uh, and others were meeting with Soviet officials, talking about Soviet aid uh, in, in the defense industrialization process. These were incorporated into broader uh, first five-year plan, second five-year plan data, so that that it it appears that there was not direct confrontation uh, for the first five, six, seven years of industrialization uh, in the PRC. Mao did, of course, intervene at various points in 56, 57 with the 10 great relationships, talks about building fewer uh, uh, conventional defense factories to build nuclear weapons. Um, he, uh, there's a debate within the military in 60, 61 about whether to, uh, to emphasize conventional versus the uh, high tech or nuclear and missile programs. Mao comes down on the side of, of Nye Rung Jun and some of the others uh, supporting the nuclear and missile program. We do know that um, that by 64, it looks like the planning apparatus uh, is, has taken over defense industrial planning uh, and uh, Mao intervenes uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, insist on much more defense industrialization 60, beginning in 64, 65 to 71. Uh, and as a consequence of the purge of Lin Biao, uh, in 1971, uh, the defense industrial uh, investment, again, seems to go down. So it plays into it, but 
it's not clear that this is a party versus army type of issue as a whole, uh, much more a sort of, of um, an attempt to institutionalize within first the military planning system and then the, 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 uh, the, the core planning system uh, and then Maoist interventions at various points um, uh, that, that speaks to um, politicians uh, sort of as they do in China, intervening in what are supposed to be more institutionalized processes. Uh, and this continues with Deng Xiaoping in uh, both in his uh, in 1975 calling for rectification uh, uh, in defense industries uh, and then when he's the premier or the the number one leader in China holding defense budgets flat uh, putting uh, the four modernizations with defense industrialization as the lowest priority uh, and using those broad strategic parameters to set things up so um, it, it, it's not a straight on party versus army uh, in terms of planning here. Can I, can I push you a bit um, there, David? Um, it may not necessarily be a kind of party versus army uh, competition, but there was a reality there that if you were in command, a senior position commanding the PLA in the 1950s, early 1950s, you would have noticed that the nascent PLA Air Force was flying state-of-the-art jets, MiG-15s, yeah. as good as any that the Soviets were, were flying. And they started having MiG-17s not that long after the Soviet Air Force were flying them. By, by the 1980s, by your say 1989, you were commanding an army equipped with museum pieces. Right. It's a pretty stark contrast to commanding an army with state-of-the-art weaponry to commanding an art, a military with museum pieces. And it didn't have to be a matter of army versus uh, military versus party. It could quite simply be that the generals and the air marshals and the admirals have every reasons to be unhappy with whatever government it was that reduced them from a, a state of the 1950s level of equipment to the 1980s level of equipment. Why was there so little uh, articulation of unhappiness? Um, you know, I think <clears throat> there was unhappiness. It was subterranean in some ways that it was clear that um, that with Pang Dapai and Lin Biao, that if you were perceived as challenging the chairman, it didn't go well for you. Um, and uh, many of the top military figures, uh, particularly those most associated with uh, modernization and uh, conventional weapons had um, uh, modernization professionalization, uh, had fallen by the by uh, over the course of the 50s and 60s. Uh, so that that, um, it, that it, it was uh, sort of a politically fraught to raise this as an issue directly. You know, this, is, this has always puzzled me. I mean, these were people who presumably faced death on the battlefront from 27 to 49, and yet were unwilling to sort of with rare exceptions, uh, to sort of stand up to Mao and, and later on uh, to Deng uh, and say, this is an unsustainable sort of position. Um, but at the same time, it's not clear what the answer was. We know, of course, that China tried to piecemeal modernize over the course of the 70s and 80s buying the Rolls-Royce Spade jet engines that were supposed to be the basis for a new uh, fighter, uh, but they never could build an airframe around the Rolls-Royce Spade jet engines. Um, and so uh, whether broader lessons were learned from that, uh, I think there was a profound recognition that you didn't have the, the, um, the scientific and technical capabilities to, uh, to catch up very rapidly. 
Um, and, and so, uh, and as uh, people like Evan Fagenbaum have offered, uh, have argued in, in various writings that, um, that defense planning and indeed much of the planning for, uh, for the 1980s came from military figures who were protected during the Cultural Revolution who tended to be associated with nuclear weapons and missiles. Uh, and they uh, emphasized nuclear weapons and missiles, but they also emphasized building up science and technology and other kinds of things to create the basis for, um, uh, for a, a more sustained catch up later on. Uh, and Dung's own experience was that the defense sector was a mess. Uh, it, it needed profound internal rectification you needed new doctrine, you needed a whole bunch of things uh, before you could begin to, uh, to upgrade the equipment for the PLA. Uh, the, the prescription was in some ways, the software had to come first before you built the hardware. Uh, and so I think there was a lot of politics. It wasn't all that obvious, uh, but for a variety of reasons, you ended up with, um, again, as I say, software first before you went on to try to modernize hardware. Okay, um, next question comes from Philip Mead. During the period, where was the locus of decision-making on three bits? A, defense spending. Two, military asset priorities. And third, production centers. I mean, by locus, he's really referring to whether you're talking about civilian versus military or province versus central or that kind of dichotomy. Um, okay, so <clears throat> the, um, these are good and difficult questions to answer. Um, let me, in some ways, um, start with the last one first, production centers. So um, we know uh, in 1964 that the general staff, the, the, I think the operations department of the general staff uh, command uh, did a study of where China's defense enterprises were located. And something like 60% of them were located in the 14 or so PRC cities in 64 that had a population of a million. Uh, this was seen by uh, the PLA and picked up presumably by Mao uh, as a profound source of vulnerability. Uh, and it was one of the stimuli that led Mao to argue for the third front uh, in uh, the interior although it should be noted that Chengdu, Cheng, uh, Chongqing, and Xi'an were among the cities that were uh, had a population of more than a million in 1964. So there already was, was material there. Uh, and clearly Mao argued uh, for uh, location of defense industries in the uh, interior. He also argued, as uh, Taylor Fravel argues, uh, and which I've argued in, a, in an earlier piece, much earlier piece in the China Quarterly, uh, for a, a, a little third front within every province. Uh, and those, it seems like there was a, a sort of um, what in the US we call pork barrel politics that, uh, that provincial leaders who were also you know, chairs of military district commands uh, saw a chance to enhance their resources to their province uh, and uh, would, uh, were quickly jumped on the bandwagon to build little third front uh, defense enterprises, which could be used for guerrilla war type of strategy um, and, and began to greatly assemble those. Uh, so once you uh, now basically sort of interior uh, and then provincial chiefs then said, well, in our interiors, we too should build little third fronts to enhance their resources. So you did get decentralization down, but the big third front 
at least in 64, 65, was, um, uh, was a centrally planned endeavor. Efforts made uh, to uh, employ geologists and others uh, good at figuring out good locations for things. Uh, 64, 65 into 66, it was a uh, fairly controlled policy, although now, as usual, insisting that things move much more quickly. Um, but so there was some control. After 69, things ran amok. Uh, we have one source saying that, uh, that for the ordnance industry, uh, Lin Biao and his people in the PLA high command uh, tried to increase uh, investment in ordnance to be three times the total invested uh, from 1949 to 1964. Uh, so control was lost. It seemed that the, that 69 to 71 with the state council sort of destroyed by the cultural revolution, the party deeply damaged by the cultural revolution that Lin and his followers controlled decisions about spending uh, and about uh, where production would go um, and so on. In terms of uh, military asset priorities, I don't have a clear sense about who was making decisions about how much relative share was going on. Uh, clearly there was mobilization uh, across the defense industries. Um, the, um, uh, you know, the, um, uh, some of this is based on, of course, uh, output data. These are artificial prices for weapon systems. So we have no sense about whether the prices Chinese used for fighters versus tanks reflected any kind of scarcity values or not. Uh, so there's an artificiality to using these output data. I, I, in terms of physical quantities, I don't have a lot of data about physical quantities of weapons produced. Uh, and, and so it's difficult to answer. I do have a few sort of things that in 1972, uh, 250 jet fighters were produced. Um, of which 50 crashed in 1972. This could be due to pilot error. It could be due to quality issues. We don't know, uh, but it speaks to one of the fundamental problems of the, uh, the high tide of defense industrialization. So I really can't give you a good answer about military uh, asset priorities. We do know that for things like the nuclear and missile program, they had first call on scientific and technical manpower and on things they needed. After that, it appears that from 65 to 72 or so, uh, aviation and ordnance came next. Naval uh, was, uh, was a last priority uh, during that time. In terms of spending, again, much of this was based on the physical planning system that spending followed followed uh, what physical plans there were and targets there were. Uh, so that again, that's a, arguably a lagging indicator. Uh, it, it doesn't, uh, particularly during uh, upsurges in uh, investment and production. Um, it seems clear to me that spending decisions were influenced by general policy lines set by both the political leadership and the military leadership um, but uh, sort of something that could be caught up with uh, sort of general patterns of economic construction and development. So on spending, I'd say uh, there was a general plan put forward at least in the 50s and into the 60s by uh, the PLA about what should be, uh, should be agreed to spent uh, in terms of new facilities. Uh, and then the political leaders could intervene, increase, decrease uh, in more or less ad hoc ways. Uh, and I'm sorry, I can't give you a, uh, a more sort of precise kind of answer to those questions, but that's what the, uh, the data seems to indicate to me. Okay, um, Philip got a second question. I'll come back to that later. In, in the meantime, I'll raise a question 
from a student in one of the London institutions. Um, have you come across evidence of China exporting its own military capabilities in the period you are studying? Um, yes, there were Chinese military exports um, <clears throat> from, in some ways, early days to um, into the 1980s. Um, that certainly the Chinese were providing military training and equipment to the uh, Viet Minh in Vietnam from 50 on. Um, that uh, that various, uh, ex there were, were small exports. There are books on this by Bates Gill and others um, about Chinese military exports um, in the 50s and in, into the 60s. Um, in the Cultural Revolution, in some of the unofficial Mao speeches, Mao meets with defense industry leaders. He gives a speech where he said, we should be the armament, uh, the armament factory for the world revolution. Uh, he says, there are even some weapons where a made in China chop should not be put on them, uh, which I read if, you know, particularly in light after 2000, uh, 9 11 2001 as suggestive of Mao thinking that maybe China would proliferate nuclear weapons or missiles um, you know needless to say this was this has not been incorporated into more official collections of of Mao's writings uh, either on military works after 49 or or other works um, Certainly, I showed you exports of conventional weapons in the 80s, also the, the Saudi, the export of the missiles to the Saudis in the 1980s. Uh, but there was a sort of friendship cooperation, missile, uh, military sales to or, or gifts to North Korea uh, and other countries so that, that China had good relations with uh, throughout the period. So there, there was you know, in value terms prior to 1980, I would say not all that significant, uh, but it was a, a part of Chinese defense industrialization. Thank you. Let me return to the second question from Philip. Um, he's asking you about something a bit rather more contemporary, a bit at least after your period. So hope that okay. you don't mind. How have the PLH learned the military lessons from the US strategic or tactical uh, operations in the 1990 Gulf War? Did it change China's industrial defense model of 1949 to 89? Um, absolutely. That, um, you know, uh, Taylor Frevel's uh, active defense goes through this quite extensively. And I would definitely recommend you look at the chapter on the doctrinal changes that take place uh, after the Gulf War. Um, and <clears throat> given the kinds of weapon systems that were deployed, uh, the precision guided materials, um, this had a, uh, you know, a shocking effect. It's widely reported it had a shocking effect on the PLA. Uh, there's also, of course, the, um, uh, the Li Donghui trip to the United States uh, and the confrontation with Taiwan, 95 to 96, where it became apparent to PLA leaders that, you know, you could threaten Taiwan with missiles, uh, but that was all you had. You're, you didn't have a credible uh, kind of conventional uh, 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 pressuring of Taiwan uh, at that time. All of this called for a fundamental rethink of both doctrine and capabilities. Uh, and so Fravel for gives you a sense of what the doctrinal changes were. Um, and, and there were uh, sort of closing down of many small, smaller defense factories, closing down particularly of ordnance factories, uh, buying Russian equipment uh, both for, for naval equipment uh, and uh, aviation, uh, uh, and then uh, efforts to uh, cull uh, state-of-the-art knowledge uh, through open source uh, 
acquisition of, of uh, not intellectual property, but of, of, uh, of what were scientific and technical papers, begin to incorporate them, uh, entice scientists and engineers to come back. There had, of course, First, been uh, military cooperation with the United States in the 1980s that uh, that led to some arms transfers uh, and some cooperation between U.S. military and Chinese PLA that that were a forerunner of this. You had a great reduction in the size of the military-industrial complex, but more attention paid to what's now the byword, civil-military fusion. Uh, a, a fundamental revamping of the kind of machinery uh, that were used in uh, defense factories, moving to uh, you know uh, computer aided design, computer computer aided manufacturing. So while you know Shenyang and Chengdu remain the major aircraft producers in China, uh, you know the floor plans have been fundamentally revamped from from all accounts, uh, so that. Um, you did begin to uh, to fundamentally change the the quality of what was being produced. You know, we don't know. Uh, you know, uh, or at least people without clearances don't know, uh, other than you know what things like the Institute International Institute of Strategic Studies tells us about more advanced equipment uh, uh, that China is now deploying. We have a good sense about how many ships they have and, uh, and numbers of aircraft, how effectively they'll be used, we don't know. Uh, you know, this is something I'm sure CIA, US intelligence services uh, pay a lot of attention to. Uh, they're, they're saying there's a, been a fundamental upgrade. Rand uh, and others have done studies about the upgrading of aviation in particular. Uh, so we have a sense that um, that things have 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 made a fundamental change for the better, but how much, you know, some of these things are only told uh, are answered by actual use in combat, and I hope we never know the answer to those questions. Indeed, could I push you here to clarify on something, which is that you implicitly highlighted, well, you explicitly highlighted how important the Gulf War was in terms of changing the Chinese military thinking, which is absolutely spot on, I agree with you totally. But the implication of that, of that was that before the Gulf War, the PLA didn't really realize how much they were behind the American military, given that Saddam's army were using a lot of equipment that were in use in China. Some of them, in fact, were Chinese made Right. And it was utterly devastating for them. Did yeah. they really not know how bad, badly behind they were in it, uh, by that point? You know, I think some of them did. Um, I, I, you know, but I would argue <clears throat> that you, um, you know, with the retirement of older cadres in the 1980s, you had the facing out of the people people who knew Deng well, who could, who had the kind of clout, you know, people like Xu Shiryo and others who could go to Deng and say, look at how bad our stuff is. Uh, you know, they knew that they, the army did not perform well in the war against Vietnam. Uh, and so they, um, you know, th that they phased out the, the sort of generation of three-star, four-star and, uh, and marshals uh, who were still alive from the 1950s in the 1980s. And Deng played, I would argue, the patronage game quite well with the younger commanders coming up, uh, may have played them off against each other. Uh, they were in some ways beholden to him as you got new leaders of the PLA Air Force and Navy, uh, the ground forces, uh, chiefs of staff, uh, defense ministers and so on. Uh, and that um, defense minister they kept old timers in for the most part, but uh, they weren't sort of politically confident enough. They didn't have the kinds of connections uh, that would lead them to say to Dung, this can't be maintained. Um, I would still argue that people like uh, Song Jian and um, Chen Chi, um, 
Chen Chui Sun uh, tended to still sort of dominate the thinking of civilian leaders about the defense industry. So you built up your missile force, you continue to expand your nuclear weapons production, you tried to diversify the kinds of nuclear weapons you were producing, um, and that remained the priority. Um, and it, 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 you know, I think there is a sort of political explanation for that. I think that, um, uh, but again, Dunn could come back and say, so what do you want me to do? Uh, we don't have state of the art regular industry. We don't have a large, uh, but a growing scientific and engineering cohort. Once we do, then priority will shift back to national defense. Uh, and I think for many, that was a compelling kind of argument, or at least one that could kick the can down the road. 1989, the, need, the, the PLA uh, intervening in 1989 sort of made it more possible for the PLA to say, we've got to start doing something about this. And Dung and the more conservative leaders facing a more hostile international environment could, could make the case, yes, indeed, we do have to start doing things. And they did. Well, thank you very much, David, for this really uh, interesting and thoughtful discussions with us. We have reached the time we have allocated for the webinar. So I have to draw it to a close. And let me also thank all those who have raised questions uh, to you and engage in this conversation. And I look forward to seeing some of you uh, at the webinar next week. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you.